Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Elizabeth Schmidt. I'm a librarian at Wright Library and uh, welcome to the Far Hill Speaker Series. This is a partnership between Wright Library and Oakwood Historical Society. We are recording the presentation so you can find this and um, other presentations at the Wright Library um, YouTube on the Wright Library YouTube page. Um, and next, the next event is April 18th, and that is going to be the Dean Dillinger and Dayton, Ohio legend, lore, and legacy with um, author Stephen Grismer. And um, uh, we have David C. Greer today here with us. We are so uh, glad to welcome him to Wright Library. And I wanna turn it over to, uh, Donna Rosenbaum of the Oakwood Historical Society to introduce him. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, thank you all for joining us on this uh, beautiful spring morning and afternoon, I guess it is now. Um, I'm with the Historical Society and I'm so thankful to the Wright Library for helping pull together this uh, speaker series. This is the second in that speaker series. Um, if you're not familiar with the Oakwood Historical Society, please visit their webpage or our Facebook page and learn about the activities and events that uh, the right labor or that a good history does for us. So on to the more important thing, which is this afternoon, I'm delighted to introduce David Greer. Um, David is an attorney. He's a former Oakwood resident and author of three books dealing with the legal system in Dayton and some of its more notorious uh, criminals. Um, as a partner of Be Beezer Greer, David has been practicing uh, law for over 50 years. Um, he's amassed a long list of legal credentials um, in the legal community, and he's also had leadership positions within the community. He's a graduate of Yale, the Yale Law School, and was editor of the Yale Law Review. Um, he's a passion for practicing law, but he also has a love for jazz. Um, he's already shared with me a lot of his uh, wonderful experiences with music, and he's teased me a little bit about my amateur flute playing. So uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I think you're going to be in for a very wonderful uh, and informative presentation. Um, that's going to be on his latest book, The Little Man Who Wasn't There in Search of Alphonse. It's a character study of a Dayton native, as well as the criminal history um, in Dayton in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So please enjoy this afternoon's presentation as David Greer weaves for us an interesting and colorful story of criminals, crime, attorneys, and the histor historical Dayton. Please welcome author, musician, and attorney, David Greer. Well, in an explosion of choked sobs, flowing tears, and high decibel moans, a lady burst into her lawyer's office. The lawyer was Herb Eikenberry, a legend in his own time and still a legend today. He was a kind of a cross between Mr. Pickwick, W.C. Fields and P.T. Barnum, uh, an amazing uh, idiosyncratic personality. He represented a gentleman by the name of Al Fouts in the uh, crowning trial of Al's career. And he's the one who dubbed Al as the little man who wasn't there. To get us kind of oriented, let's uh, go back to the scene of uh, Al's lawyer and this uh, poor sad lady who burst into his office. He tried to calm her down. She was obviously disoriented uh, in a state of total anxiety and stress. Uh, he tried to make out what she was trying to say. Uh, it sounded like a Chinese gown what she, she could be talking about that, about he, he couldn't figure out. Uh, finally calmed her down enough the, that it wasn't Chinese gown, it was Charlie's gone. Uh, was Charlie her husband who suddenly had died of a stroke or a heart attack and left her in this uh, distressed dis dis situation? Uh, or was he a, a, a husband that just ran off with uh, one of the girls from Pearl Street uh, and left her alone? Uh, or, or was, it, was he uh, her son uh, who is in some kind of terrible trouble? He, he finally calmed her down enough 
to extract from her the story of uh, Charlie's gone. Charlie turned out to be her pet chicken. Uh, she was as devoted to that chicken as uh, a, a boy in the movies would be devoted to Lassie Come Home uh, or Rin Tin Tin. And uh, she was distraught. This beautiful pet she had had suddenly just totally disappeared. And uh, Mr. Eikenberry, who was never at a loss for words, said, well, uh, it's fortunate that you came here because that's one of my specialties. I, I find missing people and animals all the time. That's part of the law practice that I uh, pursue. And if you will give me $10 uh, and come back here to my office at the same time tomorrow, I will have located Charlie and I will return him to you. So she reached in her purse, gave him the $10 bill and dis disappeared. She came back at exactly the same time the next day and walked into the office and looked around and, and there was, was, didn't look like Charlie. It was some specimen of the poultry family, but it was missing feathers. It was stumbling around and kind of figure eights, uh, obviously dazed and, and bruised and beaten up. And uh, she looked at Mr. Eikenbury and she said, that's not Charlie. And Eikenbury, again, never at a loss for words said, Madam, you have no idea what that chicken has been through since you lost him. And he gave her an account that would rival the Odysseus uh, heading back for time, 10 years of struggles to reach home in, in Ithaca. Uh, he finally persuaded her that that poor distraught looking bird, which was a specimen kind of similar to what she looked like when she came in the day before, was indeed her pet. And after hearing his account of Charlie's uh, adventures, she clutched this poor forlorn piece of poultry to her breast and in tears now, not of sorrow, but of joy, left the office another satisfied client. Mr. Eikenberry had pocketed $9.90 and on his way to work that morning had picked up this chicken for a dime at Frank's poultry yard. Now all my stories are true and uh, Truth is sometimes richer than poetry. Eikenberry, the lawyer for Al Fouts, uh, was a man who was never at a loss for words. He had a client who ran one of the great bordellos of Dayton's uh, fame uh, when it had a big red light district. The lady died and he was interviewed by the press, uh, wanted to know what kind of a woman was she? Herb's answer was, she was a wonderful woman. Many mourned her death, though few attended her funeral. On another occasion, he was in the courthouse when a lady emerged from the uh, first floor elevator and rushed up. Oh, Mr. Eikenberry, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Uh, uh, the city of Dayton has not picked up my trash for two weeks. I, I, need, I need your help. I need to do something about it. And he said, oh, I'm so glad you found me because I had just been studying up on that area of the law. And I can assure you, that if they do not pick up your trash this week, it's perfectly legal for you to keep it. Now, Herb got me into this, uh, this, this life of uh, Al Fouts, such as it was, simply because when he died, I somehow inherited some of his stuff, including two brass name plates with Herbert Eikenberry and engraved on them, beautiful pieces. I, I still have one in my office and I took the other when the band used to play out at Harrigan's on Wilmington Pike and nailed it to the wall out there. It may still be there as, as we speak today. I don't know, I've been there a long time. But another thing that I found was a letter that he had written to Al Fouts, his former client. It was written December the 17th of 1963. Al had just emerged from a five-year sentence in Leavenworth, uh, the federal prison uh, over in uh, Kansas, uh, just after serving 10 years uh, in the Ohio State Penitentiary. So he'd been gone for 10 years since uh, 
Herbert representative in the, in the famous trial. 15 years or more had gone by and uh, Al sent Herb a Christmas card. Herb responded with this letter that uh, I have in my possession and uh, which I had not really put together with the, the background of the letter until uh, I decided I had to look into the subject. Uh, I'd love to read it to you, but since I'm here to sell a book, uh, I'll have to ask you to go to the Dayton History and, and buy a copy and you can read it there. But to give you a little sample of it, uh, of Herb's writing style, uh, here is uh, a, a letter that he wrote to a lawyer who this year will be celebrating his 50th year in the, in the law, Gary Gottschlick, fine Dayton lawyer. Gary went to law school at uh, Notre Dame and uh, looking over the shoulder at, at coming back to Dayton, he started sending his resume to various law offices in town, some of which responded, some of which didn't. Uh, but he did get a letter from Herb Eikenberry. He had no idea who in the world he was writing to. But here's the uh, here's the letter that uh, Gary received out of the blue from the lawyer he'd asked for a job. Dear Mr. Gottschlick, your biographical resume is most comprehensive and illuminating and bespeaks your qualifications past and present. However, I must tell you that my professional realm is that of somewhat free and easy practice representing people exclusively disturbed and undisturbed. I must confess that for 46 years, I have lived in a legalistic demi-monde representing bank robbers, safe crackers, women of easy and uneasy virtue, petty gamblers, panderers, procurers, clothesline thieves, pickpockets, and miscreants large and small of every vintage and degree, including the halt, the lame and the blind, and all who are at outs with themselves, their God, their country and their fellow men. And so truly my daily grist and grind is not as exemplary compared to a prestigious corporate practice. Yet we do here try to serve the vicissitudes and aberrations of the body politic including the great unwashed and unbaptized. So that's that's lawyer number one who was featured in that, in that trial and he represented Al Fouts, the hero of our book. The Al Fouts's major co-defendant in that famous trial that we'll get here to some at some point this afternoon was the great Albert Scher. Uh, Albert Scher uh, was a thundering uh, trial lawyer had been the city of Dayton's or the county of Montgomery's prosecutor for a number of years and uh, ended up with a whole series of fantastic uh, criminal defense cases. If you go today, uh, well, I should tell you that Herb Eikenberry was the valedictorian of the first class who graduated from the uh, University of Dayton Law School, the old law school. 1926 is when Herb graduated, gave a wonderful speech, probably like that letter that I just read to you. If you go to the law school today, beautiful modern building, in the first floor, you will find two lawyers enshrined. There is a oil painting of, of Judge Patterson, who was the first dean of the old law school. And across the hall from him, is a bust of Albert Scher, uh, the lawyer who was represented uh, Bugs Moran in this case that we're going to get to at some point this afternoon. Now, most of the people who see those two images, and they're the only lawyers, as I recall, in, in the whole foyer hallway of the law school, probably don't know the relationship between those two men. Uh, judge Patterson was a common pleas judge here in town for quite a long time. He was a judge in the early 20s when Albert uh, was the county prosecutor. The early 20s in Dayton was uh, the scene of the great rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. They had a big rally here in, in 1921 or 22. 15,000 Klansmen were here. They inducted something like 2,100 
new members of the Ku Klux Klan. I don't know whether the judge was in the uh, 15,000 bracket or the 2,100 bracket, but uh, be that as it may, Albert, as the county prosecutor, wanted to uh, call a grand jury and investigate the Klan's activities and try to put an end to them. Uh, judge Patterson nixed that. It, there wasn't enough money to do that. So that was their, their first major encounter. The next one came 1927, uh, Albert left the prosecutor's office and became a criminal defense lawyer in Dayton. Judge Patterson remained on the bench. There was an interesting case that uh, erupted. Uh, 1919 had been a, a race riots in Dayton as well as elsewhere in the country. And the migration of people into this community had continued. Uh, Judge Patterson was not fond of that migration. And there was a bad weekend in uh, 1927 where there were five murders that happened, two of which involved uh, policemen. Uh, a man named Roy Freeman, who had not been in town too long in the middle of the early morning hours on a dark night, had a car break down and he was fiddling with his car when a motorcycle policeman stopped him. And uh, there's some conversation occurred. Uh, and Mr. Freeman apparently had a gun in the car. The gun ended up uh, in a wrestling match between him and the policeman. And the policeman was killed. Uh, the policeman emptied the, had the gun in his hand and emptied the gun as at Freeman, as Freeman rushed away. A day or two later, Freeman is apprehended out in the grounds of the old state hospital shot in the leg, uh, dragged back, uh, beaten up a bit, and uh, uh, signed his name to a confession. And within 22 days of his arrest, he had been gone, he had been put through a, a jury trial in front of Judge Patterson and sentenced to death. Patterson had represented the only two black lawyers left in Dayton at the time to represent him. And to their great credit, uh, they objected to some vitriolic uh, comments the judge made to the jury. They asked the judge to uh, charge the jury on lesser included offenses, which he refused to do. And they actually put poor Mr. Freeman on the stand to explain how he had had this confession beaten out of him. Uh, those three things that they did permitted the case to go all the way up to the Ohio Supreme Court. And in a matter of time, the 22 days from murder to uh, death penalty, and he was scheduled to be executed within a, a month or two after that, had all been delayed and ultimately the Supreme Court reversed it. In that reversal, Judge Patterson just went crazy. He made all sorts of public statements that the uh, everybody on the Ohio Supreme Court should be disbarred and this is an outrage and the man had had a fair trial and that's all that matters. Uh, the NAACP hired Albert Scher to represent uh, Mr. Freeman in the second go round, the second trial. Uh, I won't go into the detail on that if you are an attendee at the uh, Dayton History uh, old case files. I think this was one of the last ones they they put on before the current plague put us all in our uh, living rooms. But at any rate, uh, the retrial, the man was found not guilty and left Dayton about as fast as two feet could uh, work. So there, there are supporting actors in, in the trial of uh, Bugs Moran and Al Fouts. Now we've got to move into what the real purpose of this meeting is and that uh, we have called you together to try to get you to move as fast as Roy Freeman toward the Dayton History Bookstore and buy a copy of this book. And also tune in next week. Uh, Steve uh, Grismer is a fine, fine gentleman. And if you haven't been to see his uh, exhibition of the Dayton Police uh, History in the 20s and 30s, uh, which is at the uh, uh, Dayton History Museum. Uh, get yourself down there. And 
Uh, he's going to give you an engaging talk from the perspective of the of, uh, famous chief of police of Dayton during the, the period of the 20s and 30s next week. I thought I knew everything about that, but one thing I didn't know that I found in that book was he has traced the uh, fortunes of Mary Longnecker, Dillinger's girlfriend, uh, after uh, Dillinger was arrested. And as you may recall, uh, Judge Patterson, who was the judge in Dayton at the time, who turned the money Dillinger had with him when he was arrested over to Jack Egan, his attorney, and then sent Dillinger up to uh, uh, Lima, where his gang, after escaping then from the uh, uh, Indiana State Penitentiary, joined up with him in uh, Lima, killed the sheriff and got him out of jail. But that's another story. Uh, our story today is, is another piece of history. I, I was recently reading a, a, a biography written by a, a very well-known and well-respected historian. And uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson tells us that uh, biography is history. It's the lives of men and, and how they and women and how they uh, pass through life. This book, though, uh, caused me to realize there are two ways of writing history. Sometimes they get combined. But there is one way that I, I call the vacuum cleaner way, where you just vacuum up all the facts that exist. And this book had the 30 or 40 different people mentioned on every page. You vacuum all the facts and what do you got left with? You got a big bag full of facts. Uh, and, and in a sense, that's history. The other type of history is I'll call a cattle prod type of history where you have an electric stimulator that makes people think, think not only about history, but about their own place in it and their own lives and who they are and why they're there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this book uh, that I have authored, uh, I couldn't put it all together in the old uh, vacuum cleaner bag of facts. Another way to look at that is kind of a, the bass drum of just thud, thud, thud. And if I had done that, it would be, okay, Al Fouts was born. He raised hell, he got thrown into the penitentiary, got out, raised hell, got thrown back in the penitentiary, got out, raised hell, got back in the penitentiary, got out, back in the penitentiary, got out, died. That's kind of the, the drum beat of it. But there's also a snare drum that uh, puts vibrations and puts action on top of it. And there is a lot of action in Al Fout's life and a lot to be learned from it. So what I've offered you here is, is a book of not meditations, because I'm not Marcus Aurelius, but a book of musings uh, about Al. Since he spent so much of it, is he, actually, he, he lived in a, in a lot of beautiful places. Let, let me just kind of show you a couple of them. Here's where he started his uh, career, a heck of a habitation that is. The top picture is the way it looked back in his day. It's the Mansfield Reformatory where he went as a boy and uh, went out and went back in, went out, went back in. The, the way the criminal justice system works and the way it really worked in those days is you would get a sentence and then after a while, uh, because you need to get acclimated to freedom, which is a tough thing to get acclimated to, you could be put out on parole. And if you violated the terms of your parole, back you go again. So while this picture at the top, which is the way it looked at the old Mansfield uh, Reformatory looked in his days of his youth, it doesn't have a swinging door on it, but uh, Al's experience with it was a swinging door. He was in and out and violated his parole, back in, back out, back in, back out. The bottom picture is how it looks today. Uh, fortunately, it has been preserved because of uh, the, the, the movie, Shawshank Re Redemption, which used it as a set. So if you haven't been there, it's there for you to take a look at. And uh, don't be my guest because you may have to pay a little admission charge. Here's, here's the next uh, spacious and beautiful home in which uh, Al spent a good deal of time. Uh, it no longer exists where it was before uh, is kind of the arena district up in Columbus. 
there is a, a couple of high rise office buildings there where several law firms now uh, uh, fill the space. Now this is the Ohio State Penitentiary as it looked in the good old days. And we could go on, but I'll let you look at the other pictures by going on the internet. You can look at the uh, Indiana State Penitentiary. You can look at the uh, penitentiaries in California. Uh, Al was in uh, both San Quentin and Folsom Prison uh, in California. You can go down and look at the federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Al spent a couple of his days down there. Uh, you can go and then take a look at the pictures of Leavenworth, uh, where he uh, ended up his, uh, the indoor part of his career. Be that as it may, uh, it makes for interesting reading, but it also makes for a difficult job for a historian to uh, trace a man who spent so much of his time in penitentiaries because Al didn't keep a diary. He didn't write a lot of notes about what he did. And uh, obviously what he did when he wasn't in the penitentiary only becomes a part of the material we have to work with when he got arrested for it, which is uh, uh, a rather small part of, of the total uh, set of exercises. So in a sense that, that helps me as a historian because it's like a kid following the dots to, to, to draw the picture of, of what happened. Because with Al, we, we do have a lot of dots uh, and trying to get the picture together. It uh, shows us three major trials that he was involved in in his life. Uh, the first uh, of those after he had his burglary and that sort of stuff and back and forth to the reformatory, he then uh, became a, a mature young man or immature, depending upon how you qualify his behavior. And uh, his first major trial, he was represented by the great Jack Egan. Jack didn't exactly get him completely off, but he got him uh, what wasn't too bad a deal. Uh, let's take a look at what Albert looked like as a handsome young man. This is the picture of the Ohio State Penitentiary where he is headed as a result of the crime, but here's the picture of what he looked like as, as a young man, 1917. I spent a bit of time in the book kind of pawing over this picture because I find it fascinating. If you draw a line straight uh, vertically down, down the middle of his face, you see two different people. On the right side of his face, the left side of this picture, you see a pretty cold, icy looking personality straight out of a film noir from the 30s. If you look at the uh, left side of his face, the, the right side of this picture, and block off the other side, you see Horatio Alger, a, a bright and shining young man. And I think Al did have two personalities. I, I had an interesting call from somebody who's a father. I uh, saw this thing was gonna be on the uh, agenda for the afternoon. And his father knew Al after Al came out of uh, prison and uh, found him to be a very pleasant, uh, uh, garrulous and, and interesting man. There's no, nothing stupid about him. Uh, he was a professional in what he did. Uh, and I think what happened in this first trial he had caused him to, to head toward the nonviolent profession in which he uh, spent the rest of his career. This was an unfortunate domestic affair with a girlfriend, a gal named Ethel Mullins, who ended up with a kitchen knife in her left lung, which was probably her, the last use of that uh, kitchen knife. There's the, that old song about mother, if you must uh, stab father with the bread knife, please mother, use another for the bread. Uh, the, the trial uh, was, uh, Egan uh, had a, a double defense of temporary insanity and uh, self-defense. It's kind of hard to put the two together. And uh, the prosecutor in the case said, uh, how, how does it get to be self-defense if he's the one that's holding the knife? 
and uh, that was a bit of a problem. But uh, uh, Al had uh, his attorney use him to represent himself and uh, the attorney without going into uh, a wig or, or a dress uh, was Ethel Mullins in front of the jury. And they did a kind of a ballet of showing how Ethel had come at him with that butcher knife. And in the course of the ballet, it, it changed hands and suddenly it ended up unfortunately in Ethel's lung and uh, put an end to Ethel and the romance. Uh, that got Al sent to the uh, Ohio State Penitentiary for a term that if he had served the full term of his sentence, he would have been in the Ohio State Penitentiary at the time of the great penitentiary fire of 1930, when 322 inmates were burned alive inside the Ohio State Penitentiary, a really horrible situation. 322 burned alive in one day is more than were killed in the electric chair in the penitentiary in the course of, of that penitentiary's existence. So it was a really bad day at the penitentiary. And Al fortunately wasn't there. He'd been let out on parole in 1920. And uh, this gets me into another sidelight. Al had a brother named Earl, who was an older brother, who was a genius and also a, a, a world-class and nationally famous safe cracker and bank robber. Mm -hmm. uh, Earl had a, a couple of interesting stories about Earl in his first sojourn at the uh, Ohio State Penitentiary. He took a, a, a correspondence course in engineering, scored close to 100 in, in all the testing in that course, and uh, finished the entire course. Was uh, Everybody was so proud of him at the penitentiary, they put him in charge of the powerhouse at the penitentiary. Uh, so he was a, he was. I don't know if he was a genius. Nobody ever took his IQ in those days. But he had that. He had an, another interesting thing that uh, ended up with a girlfriend who did not end up with a, a knife in her left lung. Uh, he was being tried over in Pennsylvania on a bank robbery charge. And his girlfriend, who was a lovely lady from uh, Eastern Ohio, uh, sat through the trial. Every time something good happened, she'd be ecstatic. Every time something bad happened, she'd be in despair. The trial ended up uh, with a conviction, as was foreordained. And uh, Earl's request was that uh, the bailiff be sent out to get a preacher. And they brought a preacher into the courtroom. And before he went off to the penitentiary, he married the girl in the courtroom. And she remained his wife for the rest of his life. Uh, he. Uh, was on rampages of bank robbery and all, all sorts of stuff like that in the East Coast of America uh, after his last stay in the Atlanta Penitentiary, which is the federal penitentiary. Uh, he came back to Dayton and he and Al got back together uh, later on in life. But uh, Al, in the meantime, the way he missed being in the penitentiary when it burned down in 1930 was he got paroled in 1920. He knew from his experience in the reformatory that if he uh, just did his thing in this area and violated the terms of parole, wham, right back, he'd go to the Ohio State Penitentiary. So his brother's covering the East Coast. He decides, hey, it's 1920, be a good time to go to Hollywood. So he goes out and plies his trade out in uh, Hollywood. He's now become a, a, a what you'd call a stealth burglar. Remember the old Jimmy Valentine tune. Uh, there were really two ways of robbing banks. One is the Dillinger way, where the only tools you needed were guns, a fast car, and carpet tacks. You may recall that when Dillinger was arrested in Dayton, he had a whole box full of carpet tacks because when that fast car would take off, they'd throw the tacks on the road and flat tires would be the result. Those old cars had running boards too, so you could have the bank teller as a hostage on the running board until he got well out of town. Somebody told me that NASCAR really began uh, with all those cats that were the drivers for those gangsters back in the 30s. Uh, at any rate, getting back to Al Fouts, 
Uh, the other way you rob a bank is not to go in with guns and scaring people to death and having shootouts and all that that's fast cars and stuff. You develop skills as a burglar and safe cracker. And you go in at night where there's nobody to bother you or be bothered by you. And uh, he developed great skills. You got to have an acetylene torch. You got to have laundry soap. You got to have a drill. You got to have dynamite caps. It, it's a complicated process. It's not easy to, to be a good safe cracker and, and uh, nighttime bank robber. But that was his stuff. He learned out in California, however, in the, in the last thing that has a little smattering of violence in it. Uh, he was robbing a grocery store in the middle of the night and carelessly left the door open. So a patrolman who was walking the streets of Los Angeles were on Sunset Boulevard, as I recall, uh, sees this door ajar and he goes inside and there's something going on in the back and all of a sudden there's a guns start going off and the policeman empties his gun and while the policeman is reloading Al goes out through the window and off he goes uh, uh, the, the cops in hot pursuit uh, they get him and he ends up being sent to San Quentin for that one and then transferred to Folsom prison so he missed a lot of the fun in the 1920s which would have been a good time to be alive <laughs> one thing I, I should mention about this book is that because Al lived from 1891 to 1981, it's a 90-year span of time, and he becomes kind of a thread that you can pull through all of those decades. And so I tried to pack in a little bit about what was going on in Dayton in each of the nine decades of Al Fouts's life as we follow our way through it. Uh, I better jump from Los Angeles, though. He got out of there sometime in the late 20s came back to Dayton. Uh, I won't go into the, the things he did, but one of the things he was into was uh, bootlegging uh, cheap whiskey. Uh, that's a practice that outlived prohibition because people still like to save a buck uh, on, a, on a bottle of booze. And that got him in touch with a guy who was well known in the Chicago area as being uh, one of the kings of crime back in the 20s uh, until 1929 when the St. Valentine's Day wiped out his entire uh, force. Uh, let me, sh which is gonna get us up to 1946. Here's a, here's a lovely picture of Al in 1946 when he was arrested. It proves what uh, I, say at the start of the book that he was five foot two inches tall. He's just a little short guy, looked more like a banker than a bank robber. But there's this mugshot. It's kind of sad when you think of your family album that consists primarily and almost exclusively of police mugshots, but <laughs> that was the situation with Al. And um, so be it. I've got one of him back in his California days, which I would regard as his prime. This is a great mugshot of him. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's that's the way you think of Al and, and when he was uh, really in, into his, his game mm -hmm. as a professional. In fact, you, you'll see scribbled up in the upper left-hand corner of this thing by whoever the cop was that uh, took the picture down at the bottom. It says height, five foot two, weight 109. It says age 40 to 31, or it's, you should be 31 to somewhere in that bracket. But up in the upper left hand corner is this wonderful note that says knob knocker and safe blower. <laughs> so he was a professional man and he looks like a professional man. He looks like somebody out of a movie from that wonderful period of film. But there he is. So now we, we move up to 1946. And we get to a trial that is, is the, the, the second most widely attended trial. You know, in these old days, uh, there was no television. You remember Shakespeare invented television, or at least he, he predicted it. If you remember Romeo and Juliet, Romeo's out there looking up at the balcony saying, look, what soft, what through yonder window breaks. It speaks, and yet it says nothing. So, 
So that's TV, right? <laughs> Before TV, people would throng down to, to watch a, a big trial and they'd pack the place. Uh, the story is that the, the trial we're about to talk about uh, was the second most uh, attended trial in the history of Dayton. The first one was in 1944, uh, where a lovely lady uh, killed him. She loved to dance and she and it was military time and there's lots of soldiers around and she uh, had one of them back in her small apartment and somehow shot him with a rifle and killed him. And uh, that's the trial that really packed him in because she was a beautiful lady. And to add to the boyfriend that she killed with a rifle in her small apartment, it was discovered that she had two other husbands at different uh, military camps. So there's, uh, it, it, they, they say they had to almost test the uh, floors in the courthouse to make sure that there was not a problem. But uh, the trial we're about to talk about was almost as good as that. Herb Eikenberry was not involved in that one, but after the lady was found not guilty of murder, and acquitted. Two days later, she attacked her sister with a butcher knife and uh, was trying to kill her. And uh, her Bikenberry did get to represent her that time. <laughs> uh, the golden days. Well, in his bootlegging business back in Dayton, his brother Earl has now joined them all. Earl will be killed in an automobile accident uh, before, I think, 1944, 1945. Uh, so now, now Al's by himself. He got acquainted with uh, Bugs Moran. Bugs Moran, the, who either was the man who just was lucky not to be there when the St. Valentine's Day massacre occurred, or uh, at least Al claimed, uh, made a deal with Al Capone that he would let Al wipe out his mob uh, if he would be uh, able to continue in, in the business. Who knows? And the, the only people that know are dead. But there he is, Dayton, Ohio, July 13, 1946, when Bugs Moran is, is arrested. Uh, interesting guy. It looks like he's had a kind of a hard life. Uh, but he's arrested in a, in a crime that involves snatching a guy who had as those of you who are, are my age or thereabouts will remember when this was a big factory town, every factory had a bar or a series of bars within striking distance. Brown Street, which is now all sandwich shops for UD kids, was nothing but a string of working men bars back in those days. The whistle would blow and you'd get 20 minutes for lunch and you'd go to the bar and there'd be a shot of whiskey and a schooner of beer in front of every seat because you didn't have time to do more than shoot down a couple of those and before you had to go back to work. Then you'd be back at the end of the day. And at the end of the week, when Friday and you got your paycheck, you could cash your check at the bar. And so every Friday, the guys that ran those bars would come with tons of cash. So the, this particular situation with Bugs Moran, and I ought to show you his uh, buddy, Virgil Summers was uh, also with Bugs in this caper. Uh, Virgil is, uh, had a beautiful wife and uh, who was just had a two month old baby at the time of the mm -hmm. trial. Virgil had had a little trouble with the law before this. Uh, he'd uh, had a, spent some time for murder. And uh, indeed after all the trials and tribulations of these poor guys are, are finished, uh, they first, uh, in this trial, are going to get 10 years in the Ohio State Penitentiary for a $10,000 caper. And then they're, after that, they come back to federal court to get five years for a, what was probably a $500,000 caper. So it shows you how consistent everything is in the criminal justice system. But after those 15 years, uh, this guy comes out of the penitentiary and uh, is doing something in St. Louis that causes him to sh be shot and killed in the streets of St. Louis, mm. not by a policeman. Uh, his, his buddy, uh, Bugs Moran, uh, 
ends up in Leavenworth with the other two guys, uh, Al Fouts, and uh, uh, this is all over a, a federal, federal crime, and Ansonia bank robbery that happened before the, the situation that brought the Dayton case to the surface. At any rate, uh, Bugs uh, died uh, within a month or two after he went to Leavenworth, so he never came out of prison alive. All right, the caper was this. Uh, a guy who runs the bar across the street from the frigid air plant down in Moraine, Ohio, goes over on a Friday morning to pick up the cash to cash checks with. And he goes to the Winters Bank out on uh, West uh, 3rd Street and he gets $10,000 in cash and $10 bills. That's a lot of $10 bills. Uh, I had a case once that involved a ransom of $400,000 in tens and twenties. Mm -hmm. And I can remember that that was a duffel bag full of money. That's a lot of paper. Uh, but this was a lot of paper too. He leaves the bank and as, as he's uh, heading back south, uh, his car is blocked off and he's intercepted and he's relieved of the money and uh, tied up and left in the woods. Uh, the FBI has been following Bugs Moran for months because they suspect him of this other bank robbery and that it's just one of a series of big bank robberies that have been going on. The only time that they don't don't follow him is that Friday morning when they were following him and uh, thought that the guy who was in the passenger seat who I think was identified at the trial as some other guy from Chicago who disappeared and was never indicted. Um, so they call off the surveillance and the crime gets committed. And uh, downstream is July 13th uh, is when they're uh, both, he and Summers go back to Kentucky where uh, Moran was living and uh, they bring him back and the FBI has followed him hither and yon. And they've got 14 FBI agents who have been assigned to Bugs Moran. So they've got all this testimony about Bugs Moran, uh, which is uh, poor Albert Scherer's job of defending. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, if there was any suspense, the, the excitement was just watching Bugs Moran who had to testify as did Summers because they, they had to say something. And um, it's kind of Alfred Hitchcock's definition of suspense, which is waiting for the inevitable to happen. Mm -hmm. It was a little different with the third defendant who was our friend, uh, Al Fouts. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, I don't want to scare you anymore with this picture. So let's get him off the screen. There you go. Oh my God, that's even scarier. Uh, the, the case uh, against Al Fouts is that he was part of this deal to get this. They find a lot of $10 bills in Al Fouts's boarding house. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it. If you find anybody that has a picture of it, 502 West 4th Street disappeared when they tore down that whole neighborhood to make room for Sinclair College. Uh, but it was a big boarding house that his family owned, uh, housed 20, 22 people. It said even more when they doubled up. It's a big place. And uh, Al's mother also had some boarding houses on North Main Street. So the, he had a legitimate uh, business of sorts along with his illegitimate business of sorts. At any rate, the case goes to trial. And uh, Al uh, goes home as the jury goes out, he's got this wonderful Airedale named Pat and he, uh, the bell rings and he has to go back to get the verdict. And uh, he tells Pat he'll see him soon. Soon turned out to be never because uh, he was convicted with the rest of them and uh, may well have deserved to be. But there's some things about that trial that are fascinating to me and I, I hope they will be to you as well. One is the play of the, of the newspaper in the thing. The, the whole purpose of the FBI chasing uh, Moran 
was to try to tie everybody down to these the Ansonia bank robbery and other series of bank robberies. Well, that's hardly evidence that's going to go into a trial over the Frigidaire payroll stuff. Uh, but as fate would have it, after this case has been in trial for several weeks, it ends on a Friday. Closing argument is going to be the following Monday. The jury is sent home. They're not sequestered. Jury is sent home. And um, lo and behold, on Saturday morning, or I, I guess it is it's Saturday morning that the Journal Herald, the morning newspaper, comes out with an article uh, that says, oh, big bank nest of bank robbers and murders and everything else and that they're the same people that are in this trial that's going on in the courthouse. Not exactly what you'd want a, uh, a jury to be hearing. Uh, so let's go past, uh, there's a two real coppers. If that isn't bad enough, then that Saturday afternoon, the Dayton Daily News comes out with this headline. And here they are, our guys. There's Bugs Moran, there's Al Fouts, there's Virgil Summers. Here's a guy with a bad haircut. Uh, he wasn't around for the uh, frigid air thing because he'd been murdered by a gang out in St. Louis after the Ansonia bank robbery. Here's a good buddy of uh, Al Fouts's, a guy named uh, James Marshall, or Mitchell. Uh, he wasn't available for the Frigidaire thing either because he was, had, at the time of the Ansonia bankruptcy, he was an escapee from the Ohio State Penitentiary and ended up back in there. Uh, this guy, Roy Montgomery Foster, was in a penitentiary, I think, over in Indiana. There was a seventh one uh, who was uh, Summer's brother named Monk, who was also in a penitentiary uh, somewhere in Indiana or uh, Illinois. But here's, here's what you could not help seeing if you walk past a newsstand on Saturday afternoon, August 24th of 1946, two days before this case goes to the jury. Uh, and it says, oh, we expect there's going to be a mistrial plea Monday to be filed Monday morning. And yeah, there, there was. And of course, it was denied. Mm -hmm. And then over the, on the right-hand column is mob, warfare, murder, bank raids listed. And it goes on and on and on about uh, how these guys all learned these, uh, this nefarious trade of bank robbery at, and uh, safe cracking from Al Fouts' brother. And Al, Al Fouts was the one who was in charge of the Ansonia bank robbery. And uh, people have been murdered. And this is a gang that's been uh, doing on a spree through the Midwest of bank robberies all over the place and killing people. Not exactly good news. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what the jury got to hear this Saturday before the, uh, they had to decide this case. And then Al had not appeared. There were 15 witnesses that were brought into the trial on Al's behalf, most of whom uh, were uh, people who said they saw him at the White Owl Cafe on 3rd Street at the time this whole thing happened on, uh, on the uh, frigid air matter. Mm -hmm. uh, all people that uh, like to drink beer in the morning, as Herb Eikenberry described them, not that there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they, they, the rest of the defense witnesses were witnesses who would acknowledge that Al was in the bootlegging business and that's how he was connected with, uh, he'd been seen and why that Bugs Moran had stated his boarding house and uh, that was all it had nothing to do with uh, kidnapping and had nothing to do with the, the robbery, uh, but it uh, wasn't exactly the best of activities, I guess. But it explained why they were seen out at his mother's house. His mother had died recently, and that was a good place to stash booze and so forth. But the trial also, in, in those days, if a defendant didn't testify, and Al, of course, said nothing at the trial, uh, if a defendant didn't testify in those days, the prosecutors were permitted to comment on it. And the prosecutors commented on it in flames. I mean, you know, where was Mr. Fouts was in the uh, 
cafe drinking beer. Why didn't he tell us about it? Blah, blah, blah. So on it goes. And uh, the other, the sunshine in this case, and I guess I'm coming to where I, I the, they're going to haul me off the stage uh, for, for this little hour's presentation. If you want more, read the book. You'll find lots of stuff about uh, the, the sunny side of, of Al. Uh, and if Shakespeare uh, predicted uh, uh, television, he also predicted DNA. There's a, there's a speech in All's Well That Ends Well that talks about how uh, our lives are all a web uh, of, 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 of mixed threads, both good and, and ill. And the web of our life is, is sewn together that way. None of us are perfect. We're all sewn together like that. And the, the description of this web uh, of mixed threads <laughs> sure sounds like a prediction of DNA's discovery, be that as it may. There are lots of sweet things about Al, and including his dog, including them letting him out of the penitentiary uh, at Ohio State to come down for his girlfriend's funeral. Uh, uh, sad, sad story of driving him down from Columbus and letting him uh, go through the, his girlfriend's funeral. Stories of him uh, later in life when he's in town, uh, with some interesting comments about uh, not being an angel, but not being the worst guy in the world. And uh, he, he doesn't go to banks after hours anymore. He <laughs> <laughs> goes to banks during the daytime. Interesting man. Let me just end it up. I was gonna end up with a whole bunch of good things to be said about Herb Eikenberry as well, how uh, he had a cleaning woman that he befriended and got through nursing school. He had a 12 year old uh, uh, newspaper boy that he befriended, got through law school and the man became a judge of the Kettering Municipal Court. Wow. Uh, he, he was a, a kind and wonderful human being. Uh, Albert Scherer the same way. Uh, there was, I was involved with him in a, a nasty case, a Fairmont graduation where the science club of the brightest boys at, at Fairmont had uh, decided during the ceremonies of graduation, it'd be fun to have a big explosion go off. And so they'd rigged up a thing, uh, just a boyish prank. And uh, they had a plunger they would push at the, at the requisite moment and bang, there'd be this huge explosion. And it was in a field near where the ceremony was gonna be. And as fate would have it, some little boy saw the, the wire and followed the thing and was standing by it just as it went off and it blew the top of his head off and it didn't kill him, but he had to spend the rest of his life with a, a kind of a cap over his open skull, just a really nasty injury. And of course, nasty for him and his family, nasty for the, all those nice boys that were just playing a joke and had no idea of what could happen. Terrible for their parents. And Mason Douglas, a tough old lawyer, filed a suit against all the, all the parents of all these boys. And some of them had, uh, most of them had uh, homeowners insurance that had a little bit of coverage, but it was just a nightmare for all of them. Every top trial lawyer in town was involved in that thing. And uh, Albert Scher was involved for one of them. And Albert was the only one who could talk to the plaintiff's lawyer. And he got the whole thing worked out to, with empathy for all these different people that had been affected. And empathy, uh, when he was a prosecutor, he talked about the role of a prosecutor ought to be to, to help these poor unfortunate people that get involved in crime. You'll never hear another prosecutor say that. Mm -hmm. I remember going in 1969 to a celebration of Albert Scherer's 60th year in the law. He came in in 1909. And so he was uh, in his 60th year. I'm almost there myself, I'm in my 59th, but uh, he they got some, all these accolades and everybody. And then he got up to speak and everybody thought he'd tell about all these great trials that he'd been involved in in his life. No, all he talked about was his memory of going in 1914 to the 60th anniversary celebration of uh, John McMahon's career in the law who started in 1854. And all he could do was uh, share his memories 
of that night in 1914, <laughs> when he was kind of in the role I was in 1969. And I suppose there was somebody in 1914 or 1854 who could take you back a little mm -hmm. further. When I was a kid, there was an old lady that lived next door to us where we spent the summers in Michigan, who at age 12 had gone to Lincoln's second inaugural and shake, uh, shook the president's hand. Mm -hmm. She had that story to tell us. And you think that's really in my mind what history is all about. It takes you, you touch base with somebody that can take you back and touch base with something else that happened. And you find out that all humanity is uh, consistent through all the vicissitudes and changes we have. So that's my preach, uh, preaching for this sun Sunday. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the Oakwood Historical Society for letting me fill your ears. I hope you go and find the rest of the story. And I'm sure you'll be here next week uh, when you hear all the stories about uh, crime and Dayton in the 20s and 30s. Thank you so much, David. Um, I just really enjoyed your presentation. I want to open it up for questions. Oh, a question, was Al born in Dayton? Yes, he was. Yeah, and I, I tra in the book, I try to trace back his fam family and don't do a very good job of it. But there were a lot of Fouts's here and, and, and uh, some PF Fouts's as well as F Fouts's. But yeah, he's definitely a Dayton guy. And here's another question. What was the result of the Dayton trial involving the theft of the paycheck cash? All of them uh, were convicted and they all went to the Ohio State Penitentiary for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Al claims that he, he didn't like Bugs Moran at all. And apparently Bugs didn't like him. He claimed Bugs tried to kill him in the penitentiary, put mercury in his food. And uh, he had his stomach pumped by some nice young medical student from oh, Dayton. When he was out, he said, I'd sure like to meet that guy again sometime. <laughs> but he had, he had nothing good to say about Bugs Moran. Um, I have a question, just how do you research all of these stories? Um, where are some places that you go to look for your information? Well, it used to be you'd have to go to, to microfilm. Uh, I got uh, all, all the uh, mug shots of, uh, of Fouts. Uh, I got uh, through Wright State, has got the archives out there and they have all the D Dayton police stuff. There's uh, interesting stuff. There's also uh, the, the only statement that was ever made uh, to a policeman by uh, Al Fouts, which was, uh, they asked him his name and he said, you know what my name is. And then they asked him a few more questions. He says, I'm not talking. <laughs> he, he was a silent man. So there's that. Used to, at the Dayton Library, this picture of the Dayton Daily News is uh, from their collection at the uh, Metro Library. Used to be you have to go through the old newspapers and stuff uh, on microfilm. Now, if you get on newspapers.com, you can go through newspapers all over the country. Uh, it's, it's an amazing resource for researchers. It's put us in a whole new world of, of information. Sadly, I didn't get interested in this in Al Fouts until after he was dead. I, I've been in Dayton since 1937 myself. Uh, but... Uh, he was, he didn't die until 1991, uh, I think, or 81, 1981. So if I'd uh, only been interested, I could have found him and, and found stuff. Mm -hmm. from him. One of the nice things about giving talks like this is sometimes you'll find somebody that does uh, have access to information and uh, will know, uh, I guess here's, here's my sign off picture. I'd forgotten I'd, I'd left the pictures on. But here's everybody in, in the trial. Take a look at, there's Herb Eikenberry. There's Albert Scher. There's a guy from Cleveland who was a lawyer who ran for, uh, to try to give a little uh, dignity to the Fouts defense. He didn't really participate. There's Al Fouts. There's Bugs Moran, Virgil Summers. Virgil Summers had a lawyer that came in from East St. Louis and 
East St. Louis uh, had a reputation of not being the, the cleanest city in America. So he, he didn't add anything. He kind of sat there and let, uh, I think this is uh, Summer's wife. Uh, I've got some other pictures of her. She is a lovely lady, poor thing. Picked the wrong guy to have the baby with. But that's the story or part of it. The rest of it is in the little book. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming today. Um, just a reminder again, our next uh, speakers, our next speaker is April 18th. So it's not next week, it's next month. And um, that is Stephen Grismer talking about the Dean Dillinger and Dayton, Ohio. So um, that should be very interesting. So I hope to see you all next month too. And um, David, thank you again for a great presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.